Welcome back to Open Your Eyes this Tuesday morning. Uh, we've had a theme going here, um, and that theme of activism and being part of making things better in our society continues now with our next guest, Caleb Orozco. Caleb um, is no stranger to Open Your Eyes and has been a leader and an activist on many, many fronts. Um, he's here because we want to talk to him about an award that he is up for. It's the David Cato Vision and Voice Award. Um, I was reading a bit about Mr. Cato, and he was a person, an African from Uganda, who really did put his life on the line for what he believed in. And so I definitely see similarities in what you've been doing because you found yourself uh, the, under threat on many fronts. Tell us a little bit about what it means to get the award and what's your understanding of what this award means? Well, I also too had to look up David Cato. I heard him around the world, his name mentioned, and I've understood, oh, first of all, his profession. He was a teacher. And I, I connect to that because in August, after the decision, we knew teachers rallied their membership to advance the issue of good governance. And, and when you talk about good governance, you're actually talking about addressing justice issues for citizens. And in, in, in connecting that, it means then that teachers are a way to have a responsibility to help make our society better. So that's, that's one connection I have with the award personally. The second is that nobody can teach you about the value of community, serving the community or making a difference that either comes from your parents or from you naturally and you give life to that. For him, what I liked about a particular story was that he was looking for a particular LGBT event and they lied to him. But the man was so tenacious, he ended up at the event anyway. <laughs> and, and on top of that, he had taken a newspaper to court for revealing his sexuality to the public with a title, Hang Them, which is an incendiary uh, words, yes. incendiary for the public. Uh, and if you know anything about languages, where there are no systems of support to defend marginalized groups, the public is given permission to amplify violence because of a newspaper. Okay, I just want to backtrack a little bit, just for the public. Can you tell them a little bit about the David Cato Award? Sorry. No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so with all that then, it, it amplifies the idea of individuals willing to sacrifice for an issue and take a risk to bring transformation. It also lets you know that the leadership process is one that evolves with the pain that the person feels and sees. With the David Cato Award, he, um, specifically David Cato was killed in 2011. Originally it was said over some kind of payment gone wrong over sexual favors. And it's typical in investigation for investigation to see it was payment gone wrong to undermine or demean the, the death of the individual and, the and to dismiss any further investigation. So that's one and it highlights that there's no dignity for some of our people even after death. For the, for the award itself, I actually uh, was in Thailand and the woman emailed me three o'clock in the morning. I was like, what the heck you want three o'clock in the morning? <laughs> And, and so I said, all right, I'm here. But then I fell asleep again. And then the following day, she um, buzzed me again. I, of course, three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, what do you want? <laughs> she says, I have good news. I'm like, OK. And then she, um, she says, she said, oh, by the way, you won the David Cato Award. So I said to her, are you sure? Mm -hmm. Did I, you know what it was at the time? I, I was aware bec uh, a little because the first winner was Maurice Thomason. And he's a Jamaican. Yes. What I learned later after I posted in our close community group was that it's a woman, oh, I will shameless to call your name, sorry, Colette. <laughs> um, it was Colette who had the heart and believed in the idea that what I, what I have done had value. Mm -hmm. She rallied it, um, it's free world representative to, mi to make, um, to, to nominate, to nominate yeah. me. 
and she filled out all the forms. She said, in her words, it was a hell of a process to fill out. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't do it. And so when I learned that I finally won something <laughs> out of 14 people were shortlisted to five and I had the top score, I was like, cool. I didn't play sports <laughs> and it was the first time I won something. <laughs> That's wonderful. So what does it involve? Do you get a, a big plaque, uh, a, a statue, um, funds, uh, recognition? What, what comes with this award? Well, there are several layers, really. Mm -hmm. The first, really, is I get the chance to speak to a room of power whether it's parliamentarian, NGOs. And where will this be? It's, it's a gala dinner. I, I, I must be um, honest and see. I should be ashamed that I didn't look up my, my report properly. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, but I know it's in there somewhere. It will be in London. It will be in the evening. And as part of that process, it's really to educate the audience about beliefs, the dynamics around LGBT issue, and the broader implication in the Caribbean. And to leverage that, really, because we have a lot of lessons to, to share with Asia, with the rest of Africa, in regards to the non-advocacy component of the legal process. Um, so there's that. And then there are other meetings. Um, I have a meeting with the British Council, I, I, I believe I was told I would be the main speaker and they'll be launching LGBT films. Um, I, I believe they will follow up with some technical support. They'll clarify that with me whether, um, when I get to London, which is my flight leaves on the 21st. And then there are numerous engagements thereafter in terms of amplifying the effect of what they are. One of the things that you mentioned to me that, that I think might be the biggest piece of this is being in front of a room of power. Mm. Um, I think that when we had our decision earlier or late or last August. year, um, people around the world were surprised that this should happen in Belize. Um, you may not have been surprised after all the years and the work that you put in and the changing nature of our society as regards to LGBT issues. Um, there's been a societal shift as well, I think. But what else would you tell the room of power about it can be done in Belize, it can be done in your country, um, here's how we did it? Well, one of the things I realized, because I, I don't think people realize that my organization is uniquely placed to have experienced, oh, protests in 2011, protests in 2013, protests after the decision. I don't think the environmental movement ever experienced any protests. So, so there's that. But the point is, where political leaders are concerned with their power, instead of remaining silent or inactive or indifferent to marginalized groups, take a chance and reach out to these groups to understand what the issues are and identify how the planning, development planning can incorporate some of their concerns. Mm -hmm. It's about substance, not tune. Anybody can say the state will not shirk its responsibility. Not anybody will make a deliberate effort to understand what that means. Anybody can say we'll have a church state commission not anybody can see we will engage marginalized groups to be fair in the process of, na of natural justice. Uh, so, so there's this thing about dialogue. The other thing for our country, uh, country is that, they, oh, and I've learned around the world, politicians are afraid to address controversial issues, but they forget that the NGO se sector is there to help facilitate communication and dialogue, to help incorporate things which can Im immediately occur, which are part of the natural part of our system. But, and it c they can help by allocating resources to help people to understand the concept of human rights or invest in systems, like making the Ombudsman Office able to penalize, arbitrate, and investigate cases of of civil rights violation based on discrimination, give the office, the ombudsman's office more money to be more effective. Look at the legal aid center, it's a system of support. Invest in the legal aid center to reach out to marginalized population. Don't just stand there and say, it's a controversial issue. Mm -hmm. Cultivate an attitude of thinking and reflection. Because if we're citizens, then justice is for all citizens, not just the ones who are right. You know, 
know, there's a lot of reasons why this award is really important on very technical levels, on a policy level, but on a personal level. What is it? That's true. I, I personally connect to David Keita for his relentlessness. I personally connect to David Keita because he celebrated his victimhood, but he ensured to also celebrate his ability to resist legislative oppression, social oppression, even family oppression, he resisted. And so for me, he's symbolic in the idea, it doesn't matter what kind of state you live in, whether they will hang you, imprison you for no reason, or stop you at immigration because you have makeup, it doesn't matter. We know as LGBT people, we resist our oppression everywhere in the world. I love the word, that, 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 that vision is the word they're associating with this award. For you and for UNIBAM, for your uh, other NGOs who are working with marginalized people, what is the vision that you are looking at for Belize going forward? What are the next frontiers of, of important work to be done? My work is really looking at justice with an intersectional lens. What does that mean? Where women are threatened in terms of rights erosion, we need to be there. Where disabled persons are threatened with rights erosion, we need to be there. Where children are threatened with violence, we need to be there. And why do we need to be there? LGBT people have mothers and they're the ones who are on the front lines of either assisting the state to oppress us or supporting us in our movement for social change. LGBT people were once children and in the school we all know the levels of bullying and violence that takes place that none of them report because they will be insulted on top of their the violence experience. When it comes to disabled persons, we know there are persons who don't hear who are LGBT. We know that as human beings, if we don't amplify our humanity, and that means understand the pain of a total stranger, we cannot be better citizens, and we cannot speak about good governance if we're not looking out for the community and its needs. That's the focus. I, I hear the passion that you, you're bringing to this, and it makes me think that you're gonna be in this struggle at this intersection for years to come and so uh, congratulations on the on the award i want to ask though caleb um we've made very uh great strides here in our country i mean especially being a caribbean country in terms of our legislation but what do you envision for the future as it relates to acceptance and tolerance of persons of uh different sexualities um, and, and the actual policy to back that course, up as well yeah. Well, when we're looking at discrimination, for example, it's important to have some legislation in place with the mechanism to back it up and the allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. For us, discrimination is not just LGBT specific, it's mm -hmm. citizen specific. And why is that? The persons with disability experience uh, violations. Women at work receive violation. We have a glass ceiling for women in politics. We have issues of, of additional -trauma, traumatizing of women as it pertains to sexual violence. We, we have a justice system that is not accessible to the poor. You cannot tell me you will watch me walk down the street, search me because I look a certain way in your criminal profile, slam me on the ground and tell me you will get away with that. There's a way to do, do your work and do it ensuring that there's some level of dignity that is balanced out. Mm -hmm. So our work will look at systems mm -hmm. to support the, ju the justice need of citizens. Our work will look at educating our parliamentarians both sides. And I'm hoping the shadow ministers, as they call themselves, will be available when I come knocking, trying to talk to them. Our work will, will talk and have been talking with faith-based leaders. And the reason for that is simply this. When I started this work, I didn't think I owed them any opportunity to sit down and talk to them. Why? Because they are not the guardians of my rights. But it is clear that things are much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And whether I like it or not, it's important to educate people about what you're trying to do rather than assume 
we have a phrase in my community about assumption, and I will leave it there. Yeah, I think <laughs> I know the phrase. <laughs> I think it's a widely used phrase. <laughs> um, I wanted to also reiterate what you were saying. I think it's really interesting about the idea of leaders as proactive agents. Um, I think a lot of times our leaders are, will wait for public opinion, or they'll wait for the courts. Um, when you, you've traveled around the world now, do you see anything interesting happening on that front on other countries in our region or elsewhere? Well, one of the interesting things, especially in the Caribbean, is there are 10 countries with similar laws, buggery, gross indecency laws, and there are groups trying to organize. I've seen an uh, association of sex workers, I've seen or experienced really um, the effort at mobilizing regionally LGBT issue, and I've seen a conversation about inserting legal literacy into the HIV response. So, th so these are the dynamics that it's played out. It was also interesting that after the decision, um, an Antigua Barbuda representative spoke of reading the, the decision to examine its implication, and there was a shift in tone. But what we realize in our work is that the state will not come and save us. Why? The state has an unwritten policy that you don't throw out the baby with the bath water. So we carry the burden of doing all the legwork. The state will only come in when it feels comfortable that it is not going to lose votes or its power or its center of influence. That's how our political system works. Got it. Well, I, that's a lot of information, that's very right. relevant information. I, th I still think that I'd really, I'm a Christian, and I think that that shouldn't define how we get along with anybody in our community. I think, especially in Belize, there is a very low sense of tolerance. What do you say to persons who are still battling with the idea of tolerance? Because it is a, re a real issue where people will feel disconnected or apart from this whole, this whole movement that you're trying to advocate for. For, that, for the person sitting on the couch looking at you today, not being able to relate, what do you say to that person? Well, first we need to understand that discrimination and violence is not, has not been cornered, the market hasn't been cornered by LGBT. When you go down the street and you, s ask, and you see children begging, mm -hmm. I always ask, what is your mother doing not giving you food? When I see somebody homeless on the street, wondering what kind of mental health problems they have, what is the system responding to? And, and I know there have been efforts, but and each individual has their own choices. So, 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 so those are the dynamics that plays, plays out. Each individual must recognize their own power. And that power does not necessarily mean they have to risk themselves to do what I do. That power starts with mobilizing like-minded people to address inequity, whether it's unemployment, whether it's violence against women and children, whether it's documenting injustices and sending it to a human rights observatory like the Ombudsman Office. These are things people can do to make the system better. And for those persons who say, I don't have no money, I don't have no um, education, stop it. It is the people without education and without the level of literacy that, is, that, ex that drove or have driven change, okay. simply because the pain that they carry is too overwhelming to ignore. Yes, they have to do something. That's they right. have to. That's right. So once again, we, we've been talking to Caleb Orozco about his um, winning, earning uh, of the David Cato Vision and Voice Award. You can see some information there on our screen. It celebrates the leadership of individuals who uphold the sexual rights of LGBTI people. And it's a big honor. You'll be, you said you'll be going to London on the 21st. Right. Um, there's going to be a, a gala. There's going to be meetings. There's going to be opportunities to network and learn, I, I would we're, imagine. We're actually part of a group that engages uh, the, the heads of government, the Commonwealth House of Government meeting. And I believe the next heads of government meeting program is in London. Mm -hmm. And that's part of us trying to humanize our population. Mm -hmm. What we've come to learn here is the, is the message that somehow we're less than human being for advocating for equal right protection. 
It doesn't matter if you're disabled, women, children, or, or you're, you're arguing issues around sex, sexual orientation or gender identity. It m doesn't make us less than. We're still human beings entitled to our human rights. Yeah. I was thinking what you said about mm -hmm. tolerance, and it intersects with what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Everybody has someone in their life who may be in the margins, mm -hmm. or maybe you see someone on the street or yeah. someone who is um, really struggling with something. So I think that if we can remember that, um, none of us is immune to any sort of discrimination at any time. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. Or someone who is loved. That's something that it's really interesting to, to try to keep in mind anyway. Yeah, and I think it's all about understanding that we're human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen, you see so much of this across history where, you know, black people have suffered at the hands of, of, of persons who thought they were not human beings. You have the, the inability for interracial marriages, um, persons who live below the poverty line, I think it's all about remembering that regardless of you disagree philosophically, you can definitely agree on a human level because That's it's right. about understanding that that person that you're looking at from a, from a bird's eye view, it can be very much so your brother or your neighbor or your mom. And I think it's about spreading that message of love and, and tolerance and, and respect. Thank you, Caleb, for coming. And again, congratulations. You are the winner. It's a worldwide award. Mm -hmm. 14 finalists taken down to a short list. You had to be nominated by somebody else. You'll be receiving it on uh, J January 21st, the David Cato Vision and Voice Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yes. And we will be back. Thank you. Thank you.